Good morning, church family. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful Sunday morning to join us in worship. My name is Carla. I am the preschool director here at Village Meadows. And my name is Emily Rodriguez, and I'm the children's ministry director here. And we are so glad that you joined us this morning. We just have about three things to go over this morning about what's happening here at Village Meadows Baptist Church. The first announcement is, is the ministry celebration is next Sunday. So that's Sunday, April 21st at 6 p.m. And that exact same day, we will be having the dessert auction youth fundraiser, which takes place at 5 p.m. And if you are bringing a dessert or if you want to bid on a dessert, I should say, please show up at 430. So that way we have time to put your bid down. And second, we have a woodcutting mission trip coming up. The mission team is going in May. That's going to be May 11 through 17. There is going to be an information meeting about this on April 24th at 6 p.m. It's going to be in the third space. 
Um, you can sign up online if you want to attend. The sign up is in the third space if you would like to um, get more information about that. See Pastor Brian Clausen um, if you have any questions about it, you know, what the woodcutting trip entails and everything. We would love to have you come on that with us. Brilliant. And then the next and final announcement is that Passover is going to be Sunday, April 28th, and that's our Passover celebration, um, which will more, more fully explain the connection between the Old Testament and New Testament and the sacrifice of Jesus. So please come join us for that special night. You can sign up for that in the third space or at the call the church office and let us know. That being said, if you would like to participate, please, please, please do sign up so that way we are aware of the amount of food that we should prepare ahead of time. We are so glad to worship with you today, so let's get ready and worship. Good morning. We welcome you today to fellowship with us and worship together with us today. It's an exciting day to be in the house of the Lord, as is any Sunday. Uh, just, you know, two weeks ago we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, and guess what? We did last week, and we will this week, and we will next week, and we will every day. Because that's the basis of what we do, who we are, and what we have become, is because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And that's, that's fantastic news. If you're here for the first time, or if you've never taken the opportunity to fill out one of these cards, this is a connection card. Uh, it's in the seat back in front of you. Uh, we would like a record of your visit with us. Uh, we won't harass you, we won't put you on a mailing list, any of those things, but we would like the record uh, of you being here. If you would fill that out and drop that in the offering box or give it to one of our ushers or one of our greeters, uh, we would love to know about uh, you coming and, and being with us. Uh, but these, this is not just for that. We also use this card for prayer requests. If you have a special prayer request that you would like to share uh, with us, you can use this card to fill that out. And in so doing, on Monday mornings, we have a group of men that meet at 9 a.m., especially for prayer. And we share what comes in on the cards, and we uh, covenant with you over those needs uh, as we pray together on Monday morning. We're not going to come harass you. We're not going to share that information any further unless you desire us to do and get it out to more people to be praying about it. Uh, but you have that option of a way of contacting us and letting us know those things. Also this morning, it has become our practice to have our season of prayer first, which is a good practice to pray before we worship and listen to the Word of God. It helps get us in the right frame of mind. There are three things we're going to look at this morning. The first is a personal prayer, uh, what your heart's desire is. It may be that you just want to praise God in your prayer or it may be that there's something on your heart and on your mind that you need to ask Him about or you need to petition Him about because He cares. And He can meet the needs of those that uh, submit their requests to Him. We've watched God work in many different ways. And so don't be afraid to ask God for the things that you may need at this time. He always gives one of three answers. Yes, no, or not now. It's always one of those three. But He never fails to answer our prayers you know, and when God tells us no, it's because He knows that what you asked for, you don't really need. It's not in your best interest. Uh, I believe that. I hope you believe that too. But God desires to provide us everything that we need to be able to return to Him honor and glory for His name's sake. So bow with me, if you will. In this time, we'll take a, a moment for silent prayer first. Heavenly Father, You are an amazing God. And we are so just almost without words um, in our response to You for what You've done for us. You saw that we were separated from You, but You were not willing to leave us in that condition. So You sent Your Son to die for our sins, to bear those sins for us and then to be buried and rose on the third day to give us life anew. Lord, let us be what you need us to be 
in this time to be instruments in your hands, to be ambassadors of your message for your kingdom's sake. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The second part is the great commandment, having a great commandment mindset. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and might. And the second is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then when Jesus was meeting with his disciples, he told them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is not an emotion, though it has an emotional component. Love is an action. Love is choosing to see the best and desiring the best for another person. And so we can love in word and in deed um, by doing that, by doing what God asks us to do. You know, some people you might think are unlovable. They're not really, not any more than we were. You know, you may think, well, that person doesn't deserve forgiveness. Well, guess what? None of us did. But we got it anyway. I saw a little saying that said, at what point will what Jesus has done for you become more important than what somebody else has done to you? And that's pretty deep. We need to love one another regardless of what has happened, regardless of when we hurt each other, and we do from time to time. Uh, but God demands and commands of us that we love one another. So let us bow together again in that. Lord Jesus, you know we don't have the capacity in our own strength to love like you loved. But Father, we ask today that you cleanse us and fill us with your Holy Spirit that your spirit might guide us to love as you loved. Lord, that we might be an example to one another, but also that the world may look in and say, hey, something's different about those people, and I want a part of that. Lord, let us live the gospel, not just speak it, and let us love one another and love this world for the kingdom's sake. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the last item of focus this morning is to have a biblical worldview and know that the truth is there. We live in a time that feels like truth is transient. You can have your truth, I can have my truth. The scripture says there's only one truth. And truth is truth. The lie never becomes the truth. Jesus said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He also said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You need to understand that God's truth is working its way out in this world right now. And we're watching world events that are a bit unsettling to us. And they may shake us a little bit, but they never shake our God. He is always stable and He knows what is occurring. And we need to see our world through His eyes and from His perspective. And God wants us to... to Use that once more that we might serve Him. So let us bow once more. Lord, I pray this morning that You would give us the mindset and the viewpoint that is a heavenly mindset and viewpoint. Let us have the mind of Christ as we look at the world around us. And Father, I pray today that You would send Your Holy Spirit among us. Lord, as our world is shaking because of the events and they don't know what to think, May your Holy Spirit shake us for the kingdom's sake that we might have the impact in this time, that we would know what you would have us to do, that we would share the message with those who are around us, that Lord, as the gospel is shared, that your spirit will activate that. Your word says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. May you make us speakers of your word that others may come to know. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. I would invite you to stand with us as you're willing and able. Uh, I don't know if you're kind of like me. It's kind of a tired morning. I don't know if I just didn't sleep well. 
It's one of those places or one of those times when I really value this psalm and this song that we're going to start with because it's you're talking to yourself at the beginning. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You're like, hey, self, just because, you know, you're tired, you had a bad day, you know, maybe whatever reason, we can still bless the Lord because he's, he's worthy of it, right? First one says, the sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing our songs again. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your Taught my heart to me 
and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. sometimes forget what that like how to live in that scripture says if God is for us then who could be against us if we live in that grace no matter what facing what is facing us we don't need to fear the Bible it says something like 365 times do not fear we don't have to live in fear. Because if we're with God, who should we fear? Nobody. 
You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my Your grace is 
your grace is enough. Father, we can, we can bring our concerns to you. We can bring our happiness to you, our joys, our sorrows. Um, and you welcome that, and we can have that relationship because your grace is enough. It covers everything that would separate us from you. Father God, and I, I just thank you for that, and I praise you for that, Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to be ready for your word at this time. Lord, help our spirits to just be quickened, to be in tune with you, Father. Help Pastor Mike as he comes forward to bring your message. Lord, give him all the right words to say. Give him the boldness and the clarity with which to, to proclaim your message. Father, and I just pray that we'd be ready to, to take it in and to put it into practice. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Ooh, I'm loud. How are you today? First service wins. They were livelier. Oh, it's good to be together. It's really always fun. We, we enjoy, uh, enjoy you. This is the highlight of our week when we gather right in public and worship and look at God's Word together. Um, so this week, if you uh, have a copy of Scripture, please turn with us to the book of 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we are in week two of our seven-week series, and I know you see the, uh, the title series slide there uh, on the wall, and you've heard us talking about it, and we're focusing on something that, that is or should be uh, as easy as one, two, three. You know, walking through the three general epistles of, uh, you know, first, second, and third John, and you know, for the next few weeks, and because remember some of some of what we said last week, and and no doubt you'll be hearing a lot during the whole series. Uh, all followers, all believers, all Christians should do what these epistles guide us to do. We should all make sure we're grounded in the very basics of our faith. 
the very foundational tenets of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's why the, the one, two, three thing and even the throwback to the building blocks and um, the foundations. And here's a, here's a harsh truth that we need, really we need to grasp along with this, uh, this whole concept of, of being basic or being faithful rather to the basics of our faith. And the truth is, I know I, I don't care, most people don't care, I'd imagine a lot of you don't care, uh, first to know how much you or I or anyone else can know or explain some of those deep theological truths, you know, things like the Trinity <laughs> or, or eternal security or election versus free will or local church government or something that seems really timely right now, premillennialism or postmillennialism or all, <laughs> um, it, the list can keep going. Show me that you have the basics mastered, or, or, or rather, on display in your life. You know, the foundational basics of what it means to follow Christ and His Word. And then maybe we can have a, uh, other conversations. And don't forget uh, that this is what we'll be pointing out a good bit, that John was doing all throughout these three epistles. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John repeats... Uh, his concepts a whole lot through these letters. We'll see a lot of repeat. The series title slide even has the three basic concepts that, that John mentioned seemingly everywhere in all uh, of, of these three letters. And three concepts are mentioned uh, over and over again, either directly or indirectly. There, watch. You see them on the screen there. Sound faith, obedience, and love. John's writing with, with inspired authority. Remember, who this is that we're talking about. This is John the Apostle. He had talked with Jesus. He had walked with Jesus. He, he had seen Jesus perform miracles. He had watched Jesus die, and he had saw him risen. This is who we're talking about as far as the human author is concerned. And at this point, in addition to that, John is the last living apostle. He's advanced in years. And he's, he's like many of us. As we get older, we stop worrying so much about things that just don't matter. You, you, you know, you learn, don't you, what is most important and what is not. And John saw the issues that were foundational. I mean, remember, we mentioned last week, Gnosticism was, was around society and it was creeping into the church. And basically, I mean, the, the very, I mean, the most basic definition of that is, of Gnosticism is, a, is the belief that sin doesn't really exist, so it's really not a big deal. I mean, that's just a very elementary definition. And John is essentially saying, wait just a minute. There's some basics that we need to focus on. Sound faith, obedience, love. And last week, as, as we looked at uh, 1 John chapter 1, we pointed out the importance of making sure that we know what we know. And our, our point was in knowing Jesus and what, why that really matters. And as we move into chapter 2 this week, let's look together at trust and what? And it's all funny. It's, it's inflex. It's how you say that. It could be sarcastic. It could be, a, it could be knowing. And because you remember that old hymn, it, in, the, in the flesh it might seem quicker to do the first part, trust. Not, not always, but sometimes it may seem quicker. But God's Word, Scripture, it requires obedience. We see it all throughout these epistles and many other places in God's Word as well. It is obedience. And, and that means we don't always do what we want. We, we don't always choose to and then fill in the blank, whatever that may be. We don't always lean on our own understanding. Seems like there might even be a, a verse or two about that in here somewhere, right? It's not about us and, and, and our perspective always. And as we move into, into 1 John chapter 2, we will see at least one of these three concepts we mentioned throughout this chapter, and we'll see a little bit of all of them, but what we're going to focus on today really is obedience. So let's take just a few minutes. Let's, let's dive into this together. Let's, let's look and be prepared to not just say trust in what, but to, but to actually do what John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is encouraging, even instructing us to do. We're, we're going to examine this chapter and point out some observations together. They'll form a bit of an acrostic, but not really quite a traditional acrostic. And believe it or not, we don't have alliterated points today. I know, it's weird. Each point, nine of them, 
is built off of a letter in the word obedience. And why is that? Because at least from, from my imperfect, imperfect perspective, that seems to be the primary emphasis of this chapter. Now, there are actually three or really four primary groups that, that I know I've been praying for when it comes to, to who would be impacted by this message. First is, is the unchurched or the unsaved. You know, whether here with us in the room or, or watching online or the recording later, those who don't know Jesus on a personal level, we certainly pray that God just pierces your heart and that changes. The next group is those, those who are currently a part of either our fellowship here uh, or, or another. Maybe, maybe you're here with us as a guest or watching online, uh, but you're an active Christian. You're, 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 you're pursuing your relationship with Christ. So we're also we're praying for that group. And then... And third group is one you've heard us talking about a little bit lately because it's becoming more and more in our heart. And that's a, a group of folks known as the de-churched. Folks who, for one reason or another, they were in church and now they're not. Now, it could be church hurt. It could be mistakes. It could be, you know, out of fellowship and the list could go on. And then finally, there's a fourth group who um, I don't believe has ever really been mentioned until, well, the first service technically mentioned at the end. But it's a new explanation of a group that, that it's really, God's been putting on my heart, especially over the last week. And it's a group that I fear and even know to exist in many local churches today. And so I've, I've coined a new phrase, and that's a group that I'm calling the actively de-churched, if that makes sense. And what I mean by that is those who sit in our chairs every week, pews, chairs of other churches, and they're just going through the motions. They're physically here, they're just doing their thing because of one reason or another, and it's not that they're a bad thing, but they're just not where they were in their walk. Does that make sense? So those are the groups that, we, that we're really praying for this morning. So if you're ready, let's dive in. You ready? That's encouraging. Um, trust in what? Obedience. Number one, watch this, because it should be obvious. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 1 with me as John writes, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So remember, John the Apostle, don't forget that. And he's writing from the perspective of authority. We touched on that for at least two reasons. One, he's the last living apostle. That's pretty significant. And then two, he's old. At this point, he's in his upper 80s, lower 90s. This, this letter was written somewhere around 50 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And with age comes wisdom and authority. You know, I was, I was always taught to respect my elders and others, but not just because they were older, but also because that age brings experience that I just don't have. And when you have the privilege of getting wisdom from someone in that age group, take it. We have a few of those saints in our fellowship, and, and man, we, we appreciate what we, can, what we can learn from y'all. And please keep teaching and sharing that wisdom with us. And now think of that here. John, he's writing to his little children. And at this point in his life, most everyone is going to seem like children to John. <laughs> you know, in about nine or ten weeks or so, I'm turning 50, and to my children, that seems ancient. To me, it does in some ways, because my father passed away rather young at 52, so I'll always think early 50s are kind of old. But some of you, I, I know exactly what you're, you're doing right now. You're laughing and saying something like, yeah, if you only knew, kid. If you only knew what was coming, right? I mean, I, I, I get that, I know. And I, I realize there's so much many of you know that I simply can't know yet. Give me another 25 or 30 years and, and I'll catch up with you. A lot of what I'm just beginning to learn is just everyday stuff to, to the folks in that group, right? Things like, man, I'm, I'm realizing more and more I don't want to get out of bed. It hurts. That's the perspective John's writing from if you think about it. And not physical age, but spiritual as well. Because listen, some of us, you know, there, there's some in our, in our group that may be 
young physically, but so much more mature spiritually, right? I mean, that happens than people who are decades older than you in other ways. But here's John. John was both. See, John's writing to remind them and us of just how obvious our decision and our motivation to obey Jesus should be. Sin is a choice, but it's still sin. It's not just a matter of choice, and, and, and it's okay no matter what. No, we choose sin, and, and don't get me wrong, we won't be perfect until we see him face to face. But the sad fact is, John's pointing out, we don't have to. And, and the good news is, though, we have an advocate with the Father, and his name is Jesus Christ. And you know what he did for us on the cross of Calvary? He paid our sin debt. He, he, he sealed the deal with his resurrection. And that, that's what perpetuation means. It's paid once and for all. And that offer is available for any who would claim it. So it should be obvious. If he did something we couldn't for us, if he paid a debt we couldn't pay for us by his own choosing, it should be a given that we obey his word. It should be obvious. Trust in what? Obedience. Because, watch this number two. Here's how you know you're one of his. By this. Verse three. And by this, John writes, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Are you a Christian? Not all of you. Hey, don't tell me you are. Show me. How? Am I following this? Apply this to your life. Make sure your life is in line with this. We follow Him and His Word. We obey His commandments because we are His. If, if, we, if we don't have that consistent pattern in our lives and we call ourselves Christians according to what we just read, we're lying. Don't take it up with me. Take it up with that. This is the number one test. Not perfection. This isn't what we mean, remember, but John's driving his point home. If you say you abide in him, if you say you abide in Jesus, if you really follow him, then by following his commandments, his word, you will be known. By your fruits, some might even say. I mean, I, I know there are seasons, times when we all fall short. The de church thing we mentioned, it's real. But overall, in, in the long run, there's a surefire way to know if we are His. And that's if we are abiding in Him. Because the whole following Jesus thing, for Christians, it's not optional. Trust in what? Obedience. Watch this, number three. Because of the edict. Verse 7. <clears throat> Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You know, Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, can seem overwhelming. Dry even. Boring at times. Surprising to hear preachers say that, right? But hear the next statement. That is only if you are in one of two categories. Either unregenerated, uh, non-Christian who, who has yet to enter into that personal relationship with Christ, or a Christian but not spending time in the Word for yourself. Please hear me. I don't mean that to sound as critical as it may. And, and, and spending time in his word looks different for everyone. Uh, some, some need to take it in smaller doses than others as they grow into it. We have the blessing these days of, of various translations that can help us to better understand God's word. Just make sure it's a, it's a quality translation. Uh, there are all kinds of ways and help 
these days as, as well. I mean, we, we, there is some positives to some technology, right? And there are some technologies out there that you can use that can help you. It, but I know it can seem overwhelming. But even if this seems overwhelming, even if at some point it may seem old and dusty, it's not. Because watch this, John's point is that it becomes new all over again. It, it is, it's fresh again if we'll invest time and effort into hiding it in our hearts because don't forget it's alive and powerful. And this edict is not an option. If we want to know more about Jesus and how to follow him faithfully, YouTube and TikTok are not the best places to get it from. And don't take my word for it. Dive into it for yourself. Get into it for yourself. And you know what? We're glad to help you with that. We've got small groups at all kinds of times. We've got Bible study groups all throughout the week. Let me, let me know if, if you need or you want more help with that. I promise we'll make it happen. Trust in what? Obedience. Because if you do, watch this, number four. There is not darkness. Verse nine. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Remember the three themes we'll be hearing a lot. Here's, here's a part where all three are included. Sound faith, obedience, love. You can't hate a fellow, belie a fellow believer. At least you can't do that and actually be a Christian yourself. And don't get me wrong, you can be mad at them. You can be disappointed in them. You don't have to like them. Hallelujah, right? But we're commanded to love one another. But you can't hate them and be real. If you are or if you do, you're in darkness. And if you're in darkness, what happens? You stumble around and at best you stub your toe. You might fall and hurt yourself or others around you. So sound faith. I mean, it takes faith sometimes to love, right? I mean, trust me, I know some of you. It takes faith to love. And I know me. It takes faith to love. I get it. Obedience, don't hate. Love, for real. Love one another. If not, it's darkness. But that also means what? We remind ourselves of this all the time. We say it a lot about the whole interpretation of Scripture thing proper, right? If the positive is stated, the negative is implied. And if the negative is stated, the positive is implied. You know how we say that all the time, right? You, you remember? Or at least lie to me and say you do. But if both are there, it's of extra importance. And both are stated here, positive and negative. So that means it is extremely important. Love removes blinders. Trust in what? Obedience. Watch this, number five. John says, here is why I write to you. Twelve. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Man, John likes repetition, doesn't he? Almost like a broken record, but a good one. You know, we said last week that we'd be seeing a good bit all throughout the three letters. And here's a great example of it. And, and John is writing, and remember, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so it must be important, even necessary. They needed constant reminders. So John gives them exactly that. I'm writing to y'all. I guess he's from the South. I'm writing to y'all to remind you why you should obey God's word at all times. Your sins have been forgiven. A debt we couldn't pay wiped out. We, we've been given the right to be children of God. He targeted all of his readers here. Then, see, he targets fathers, maybe those who are leaders who, who you know, might start to think they're kind of important. The one you know that we're talking about, God the Father and Jesus from the beginning, he's, he's worth following. He's bigger than anything we will ever be. Obey him. It all belongs to him anyway. Then, then young men who, let's be honest, can tend to think they're stronger than, than anything that might come their way. Writing to you because you have overcome evil, but not by yourself. 
And John says, or writes all of that twice. I, I find comfort in that. People needed reminders then, just like we do now. I mean, I, I know I need to be reminded quite often of who I am and, 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 and who I serve and why I serve Him and why I obey Him. It, it's, it's healthy to keep that constant reminder of, of why we do what we do. Thank you, John, for that. Trust in what? Obedience. Number six, this will help. Have an eternal mindset. Fifteen, listen. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You ever, um, you ever get to thinking about all that is going on in life right now? What about world events? Or maybe things you want to do. What kind of goals do you have for the next year? Do you, uh, you filter them through the lens of here and now or the lens of there and then? The problems we have now of determining our goals or our desires or what, they're, they're usually based on the short view of this life. And that same problem existed then as well. John had to tell them already. I mean, here we're, we're less than 100 years after the resurrection. And John's already having to say, don't love this world or the things in it. And if you do, it is evidence that the love of the Father does not exist in you. Man, that's harsh, isn't it? But it's necessary. Do you see why? Everything this world has to offer is passing away. Soon to be forgotten. But following God's will, obedience... Brings the ability to abide forever. Trust in what? Obedience. Number seven, even when you see those who are not of us. Listen, 18. Children, it is the last hour, and so you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that this is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Have you ever, you ever seen someone who, man, they seem to be on fire for God. They're doing great things for the kingdom. And then it seems like they just stop. Or they even go harder the opposite way. And they even seem to be pushing against the things of God now. And there's probably a lot of more public examples than others, but but whichever, it hurts when we see that, doesn't it? It does hurt. It's confusing. It's never anything we want. But John has a comforting perspective if we think about it. Because in verse 18, he's saying, We know that the time is getting short. We know that many antichrists have come. But the comfort, even though it's still hard, here it is. If they were part of us, they would have stayed. But God ordained it so that they went out and it would be obvious to us that they're not of us. At least we know where they stand and where we stand. And with that and all the other possibilities of distractions for us, John then goes on to one of the best reminders of why we should obey God's Word. Trust in what? Obedience. Watch this number eight. Because you are consecrated. Verse 20, I love this. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. In verse 25, And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. 
but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. There's all kinds of reasons, there's all kinds of evidence of why we should obey. But here's perhaps, at least for me, the best reminder. We have been anointed. We've been consecrated by the Holy One. And please don't take these verses out of context. John isn't saying we should never seek to learn more knowledge. John's saying that when we enter into that saving knowledge of our relationship with Christ, no one has to teach us that. No one has to tell you that you're saved or give you that knowledge. It's personal. It's real. And then we start growing from that point on. Trust in what? Obedience. Watch this number nine. And you will endure. 28. And now, little children... Abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. John gives some of the best advice when it comes to being nervous or, or, or ashamed <clears throat> when it comes to standing before God or when he comes back. You ready for what that advice is? Just be faithful. Endure. Abide in Him. Don't give up. I mean, don't get me wrong, we all have plenty of stuff we've done that no doubt we're ashamed of, right? Our list could go on. But John just said we, have, we can have confidence and not shame when He returns, when you stand before Him. It's not about perfection, it's about tenacity faithfulness, obedience. Don't give up. But I know how hard it is. A lot of us either want to give up, or we've given up before, or we've already given up, or we're tired, or we have been tired, or chances are you'll be tired again one day. Does that pretty much hit all of us? Two things come to mind. Two quotes I recently saw. And the first applies to church as a whole, corporate church. And it goes like this. The Alamo started out as a church, ended up as a battlefield, and is now a museum. There's a lot of churches today that have followed that same pattern. Same thing we said in the first service, Village Meadows, let each of us do our part to make sure that doesn't happen here. And the second one applies to each one of us individually who make up the church. Maybe you're one of those who are tired you're worn out. Life's a struggle. People sure don't make it better. Right? Life would be so much better without people. <laughs> Maybe you're one of those actively de-churched. Maybe you're just trying the whole church thing again after some hurts. I understand, honestly, both possibilities. I've been there myself. But here's the second quote. This one sure keeps me going on the darkest of days. Pastor Mark McEwen said at the beginning of the service, at some point, you have to let what Jesus did on the cross for you be bigger than what someone did to you. Don't give up. What does all this mean? You know, trust sounds easy. Obedience sounds easy when we talk about it, when we're talking about God the Father and Jesus. But then we get in our own way. Life gets in the way. People get in the way. And people get in the way. And all of a sudden it sounds crazy. Because I could be much happier doing my own thing. A deserted island somewhere. My own way. But if you want to hear well done, it means trust and obedience have to be your way of life. We pray with me. Lord. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Lord, for paying a debt we just simply can't pay. 
We don't deserve. There's no way we could earn it. But you died on a cross to pay for our sins. You rose again. When we praise you and we worship you. Your word demands obedience. Deserve is an understatement of what you deserve of our obedience. When we ask that our hearts in this room or any watching later break our hearts for you. May our focus, may our everything be about you. It's in your holy name, your name alone, Lord, we pray. Amen. And God's people said, well, hey, we always want to encourage you as, as you make your way out. You know, uh, one of our staff team is going to be out here in the third uh, space in the lobby at the connection point. If you have any questions or just want to chat, be a couple of us up front. We'd be honored to do that as well. Um, make an impact for the gospel this week. What do you say? Sound good? Have a great week. Thank you.